Oh, I think right. Was- <laughs> <laughs> um, welcome, everyone. I'm going to give a couple minutes to get let people get on. I'll say, make sure in the chat you can tell us where you're tuning in from tonight. Oh, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So we've got a bunch of different uh, time zones. Yeah. Coming in today. <laughs> Don't talk to me about time zones, not not the moment. <laughs> I'm still in London time. <laughs> oh boy, is that true? Mm. My sister's Seven. in the West Coast. Oh. All righty. I think we can go ahead and get started since we started a little behind. Um, but I just want to say hello and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Maggie and I am the children's programming coordinator here at East City Bookshop, a woman-owned community-focused indie bookstore located at the heart of Washington, D.C., just a few blocks away from the U.S. Capitol building. Um, we are so excited to be with y'all tonight. And before we get started, I just have a couple of housekeeping items. Um, we will have time for questions uh, after Virginia and Sabrina's conversation. So if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A box so that we can easily see them. Um, we would love for you to keep the chat box for your general enthusiasm. So yeah, make sure to tell us where you're tuning in from. And you, know, you can put in why you love historical romances, why you love Virginia and Sabrina's books. We'd love to see it. Um, also, if you have any technical difficulties, please let us know in the chat and my colleague Emma um, can help if necessary. Uh, they're monitoring that. Um, also, if you need to purchase a copy of any of the books mentioned tonight, you can shop on our website and we ship anywhere in the country. Um, and even though I plan kids events for uh, East City Bookshop, my favorite genre to read is romance, especially historical romances. And I love the Marywell Sister series. I have swooned every time our hero breaks down the walls of a Marywell Sister's heart. And I'm so proud of each sister as she realizes that she deserves the happiness that she's found. And, you know, the spicy scenes are just a bonus. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> uh, a bit about this book, Never Wager with a Wallflower. Um, Miss Venus Marywell has been waiting for her prince to come since the tender age of 14. She wants a man who is a selfless academic like her and free from all the wretched vices her gambler father enjoyed far too much before he left the Marywell sisters practically destitute. Unfortunately, after a slew of romantic disappointments, there is still no sign of that prince at 23, and the only one true love of her life is the bursting at the seams orphanage in Covent Garden that she works tirelessly for, an orphanage that desperately needs to expand into the empty building next door. And for Galahad Sinclair, gambling isn't just his life, it's in his blood. He grew up and learned the trade at his grandfather's knee in a tavern on the faraway banks of the Hudson in New York. But when fate took all that away and dragged him across the sea to London, it made sense to set up shop here. He spent five years making a, su making a success out of his gaming hall in the sleazy docks on the East End. And enough time, or in enough that he can finally afford to buy the pleasure palace of his dreams. And where better than in the capital's sinful heart, Covent Garden? The only fly in his ointment is the perfect building he's just bought to put it in also happens to be right next door to the orphanage run by his cousin's wife's younger sister. A pious, disapproving and unsettling siren he has avoided like the plague since she flattened him five years ago. While Venus and Galahad lock horns over practically everything, and while her malevolent orphans do their darndest to sabotage his lifelong dream, can either of them take the ultimate gamble and learn to love thy neighbor? And a bit about our authors tonight. When lifelong insomniac Virginia Heath was a little girl, she made up stories in her head to help pass the time while she was staring at the ceiling. She did this every night for over 40 years until one day she decided to embrace the insomnia and start writing them down. 
Now her absolute del- to her absolute delight and utter astonishment, her slightly racy Regency rom-coms are published in many languages across the globe. When she isn't furiously writing romance fueled on far too much English tea, she likes to travel to far-flung places, shop for things she doesn't need, and drag her long-suffering husband and her devoted Labrador Trevor on long walks around her nav- native London. Sabrina Jeffries is the New York Times bestselling author of more than 50 novels and works of short fiction, some written under her pseudonyms Deborah Martin and Deborah Nicholas. Her writing has been published in more than 21 languages, and there are over 9 million copies of her books in print. After earning her PhD in English literature from Tulane University, she chose writing over academics, and now her sexy and humorous historical romances routinely land on the New York Times and USA Today bestseller list. Sabrina lives in North Carolina with her husband and adult son, who has inspired her to actively champion the cause of autistic children. Visit her online at sabrinajeffries.com. And now I am going to let these two take it away. (laughs) Okay, I suppose I'm supposed to start since I have the questions. But I have to say one thing about your bio. You know, I've known you for a while, but I haven't ever read your bio. And when I read the part about making up stories while you were staring at the ceiling, that is how I started. My mom always made me go to bed at eight. And, (laughs) you know, I'm 12 years old going to bed at eight and bored out of my gourd and I would just make up all these stories so it's I guess a lot of us I wasn't even an insomniac I just am a late night person so yeah. that's I think, I, it, I think I think you're born a storyteller do yeah. you know what I mean it's in your yes, blood I agree, the fact I agree. That we both have, have done it since we were children like automatically I just think you can't help it like you're born an artist or you're born a you know yeah. whatever you yeah. but yeah I think it's something in inherent within you that you've got to get out yeah when when other people ask you uh where do you get your ideas what they don't understand is that if you're born a storyteller you can't stop the ideas from coming they just fling themselves me alone <laughs> By getting to your wonderful book, Never Wager with a Wallflower, good advice for Gal. He needed to pay it heed. Well, the first time he was okay. But anyway, I don't want to give too much away. Um, I love that Gal ahead is a self-made man rather than a lord. Um, is that a favorite hero type for you? It is for me, although I don't write many, but do you find it difficult to write that sort and still make him appealing to readers who seem to always expect lords in their regencies? Well, I suppose the, the short answer, well, there isn't a short answer. I'm going to waffle on because that's what I do. And I'll apologize everybody in advance. Um, I am a Londoner born and bred. Um, when I've looked into my family history, you know, we are a low born family all the way through and they come from the East end of London um, and as much as I, I do write dukes, I do write lords, I love all of those, but sometimes it's nice to mix it up a little bit. And when you have somebody who's a self-made man, who's, who's dragged himself up by his bootstraps, there's something about a person like that. There's a richness to a character like that, that you perhaps don't get with, with somebody who's grown up with riches. Um, so I think that um, I've written a couple of like men who've, uh, heroes have done that and and heroines the whole Merrywell sisters they've all come from nothing as well and I think it's really interesting to play with that and I think it's also really interesting to take stories out of ballrooms and uh, because the regency was such an interesting time and if you if you're just in ballrooms and stately homes and you don't get to experience like the rest of it so I don't find it hard to write heroes like that I actually think I prefer to write heroes like that I've even when I write an aristocrat, I, he's got to have something else about him. He can't just be, right? Can't just be an aristocrat. There needs to be something more. So yeah, yeah I'm, that's I'm the same way. I I I really do. I I write a, a plenty of aristocrats because I grew up reading. Okay, don't everybody shudder, but I grew up reading Barbara Cartland. I didn't get George at yeah. where I was. I read Barbara Cartland. That was what was the big thing then. And, you know, I discovered this whole world of lords and ladies, but, you know, 
over the years, yeah, mining, I'm like you, you read all these things when you're doing your research and go, ooh, I want to stick that in. Nobody knows about that. I've never heard about this. And yeah. so, yeah, and I like that about your books too. You do the same thing. I, th I think, and I've, I've seen you do it. You, you, find a, you find a piece of history and you think, actually, how am I going to weave a story around this particular thing, you know? And 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 you you sometimes the 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 plot fits the characters and sometimes the characters fit the plot don't they right. you know it kind right. of like works different ways but whatever works hey <laughs> i agree i totally agree okay uh next question i enjoyed reading venus's diary entries what made you decide to do that in this particular book of the series when you didn't do it in the others? Do you know what? I think because in the whole series, Venus goes on the biggest journey because in the first book, Never Fall for Your Fiancé, Venus is 18. She's very immature. She's a little bit annoying, you know, and I, and teenagers are a little bit annoying, aren't they? And sometimes they're a lot annoying. And I kind of, you know, I wanted you see that path of who she is. And then in book two, Never Rescue a Rogue, she kind of, she's grown up a little bit more. She's taken off the rose tinted spectacles. She's grown up a bit more, but she's still only 19 years old. So, so to bring her to 23, rather than, I just thought it'd be a fun way of like, also it pays a little bit of homage to the other books, you know, some of the diary entries, like talk about things that happen in the other books. Um, but also I just thought, yeah, sometimes I just like to mix it up a little bit. And I thought, well, I'll do a little diary entry for her because it shows the reader. It, it shows that progression from the child we first met to the woman that she is right. now. And you kind of when you read them all, you kind of go, oh, OK, now I get Venus. So, yeah, I thought. Yeah, because, yeah, I have... yeah if, because if you had put it like as backstory her thinking it through and all that that would have been boring it's yeah. much better i think as the diary entries i've forgotten the name of the book um it was in your school for heiresses series and it was oh. the teacher one and she wrote letters there was a, she was writing letters backwards and forwards to this yeah. mystery yeah book. that's the whole series she does that in every book yeah, yeah. yeah. But that was a really good way of kind of teeing up their romance, wasn't it? This kind yeah. of, kind of, it's playing around. I love the way you did that. That was, what was that, the final book called? That's going to bug me. Um, <laughs> Wed him before you bed him. Oh, which, yeah. I love that title too. <laughs> she doesn't do. <laughs> no, she doesn't. No, she doesn't. And fair play to her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My my editor came up with about half of those titles. That one she came up with, she came up with uh, um, is only a Duke will do. Yeah, it's in that series, and she came up with that one. And I was like, "You are so good at titles. I suck at titles. I just do." See now, do I love a title. When I did, never fall for your fear. These say. are great titles. Yeah. These, these I good. didn't title to start with so we never fall for your fiance and I'm veering off topic I know I am but there's a line in never fall for your fiance where you know he pays Minerva Merriwell to be his fiance right, to, right, right, right. to yeah. trick his mother and his best friend Giles who's the hero in book two is like giving him a lecture and saying you know I know she's an attractive woman but the worst thing you, you know the worst thing you could do is to fall for this woman. Never fall for your fiance. And I thought that's the title of the book. There you go. So yeah. That first title, I thought I like the I like the cadence of that title. So then the next one was like never rescue a rogue. So it was fall right. for your fiance, rescue a rogue. And this one's wager with a wallflower. I kind of, you know, like to play around. But I lo I love I love making a title. Well, these these are great titles. I um my series is coming up. I've got it. I've got the whole series planned and I've got um and I'm writing the the first book and we still have no title for the series and no title for the first book. And she said, "Let's just see how." I'm like, 
Okay, I, I really, I like to have it at the beginning. I don't know why, I just do. Um, my next series coming up is Miss Prentice's Protégés. And I had the series title before I had the the book titles. And then I the first one is called um, All's Fair in Love and War. And there's uh, Look Before You Leap. And I had all the titles like before and Practice Makes Perfect. I can't remember what the other one is. That's going to really bug me as well. Jet lagged. Sorry. I, I <laughs> got today from London to San Diego, was awake for 24 hours. So, you know, I'm still not quite sure what time zone I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I can't believe you answered my last question before I got to it. Okay. So, um, when you're writing a trilogy, this is a trilogy, right? You're this is yeah. only the three books, right? It's um, the same as yours. Your yeah, 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 it just hap yes, it just happens to be. Which do you find the hardest? The first book, the second, or the last? And oh. um I think the first is it book always the same. Hard. It might not even was always be the same either I don't know yeah, no I think it depends on the book and it depends on the story depends on what's going on in your life so the first the first book was probably the hardest to write because when I was writing it, it was uncontracted it was something different I knew it was a bigger book you know I've written a lot of books for Harlequin I knew it was a bigger book it was it was a difficult one to write in that you know, I was, it was, I was doing something different, more characters, more, you know, longer length book, same, all my books, are, you know, I write the same for whichever publisher, but a bigger book, you know, that was, that was the harder one to write, I think. Never Rescue a Rogue, that kind of wrote itself. And, you know, you know, some books are like pulling teeth, aren't right. they? And other right. books like write themselves. So, Never Rescue a Rogue. It was lockdown, second lockdown in London. And um, it was just me and my husband. And and every single night we would do this mile long walk with the dog. And he would say, well, what are your characters doing? What have the characters done today? Because we had nothing interesting going on in our lives. The only interesting thing going on in our lives was these two these two characters. So they became really real to us. So Never Rescue a Rogue was really easy to write. And Never Wager with a Wallflower was kind of somewhere in the middle. You know, it wasn't as easy as Rogue because I felt I needed to finish the series off. And um, But it wasn't as hard as Never Fall for Your Fiance. What about you? Which one was the hardest to write in I think the Dragging Debutants? I think the first books are usually... The hardest for me in, in the case of my current series, though, Diana's book just kind of wrote itself. And then um, the hardest one was Eliza's, which everybody seems to love. And I'm like, that book was so, you know, when it's hard for you to write, you don't quite love it as much as every as everybody but else. You know, that old adage, adage is sometimes true, isn't it? Um, hard writing is easy reading or easy yeah. reading, hard writing. Because yeah, I've had... Yeah. There's no logic to it. I've had books that have just been so painful to write and you just think, oh my God, I'm banging my head against the desk with this. And then readers love it. And you're like, yeah, well, I must have, you know, I think I've written garbage, but actually I've, I've written something okay. Well, <laughs> who knows? the formula works, isn't it? There's no rhyme or reason to it. Yeah. Yeah, and this the last one was... You've written a lot, seeing as we're talking about like books that are hard to write. In your whole career, out of all your books, which one was the hardest one to write? The the book that you just almost never got written? That's... Let me think. Um, I would say Project Duchess probably... Because wow. I had changed to a new publisher and I had taken on something that I realized later was a lot harder than I had thought it would be, which is three dukes in one family, which actually happened to one woman did marry two dukes and almost married a third. So I figured it could happen. But um, 
uh, the the whole you know doing that then it was and then the the mystery had to go on beyond that and all of that and I, I didn't know how to convey all these tangled relationships and uh it ended up having a lot of, of edits and and my editor did make a really good suggestion to start it to to help it uh, work better. It was complicated because I had all those dukes and they were all half brothers. And it's like, all of a sudden it's like, oh, this is harder to write than it was to envision. <laughs> it was fine in my head. It's such a good idea. Uh, so, <laughs> such an easy task, but probably that one. And, and sometimes, and you probably have experienced this too, sometimes the topic is so close to your heart you know um that you you just um you I mean I cried my way through married to the Viscount which is a very old book of mine but the hero can't have children um and so his response to children is not to not to be around them and I know that's more of a female thing, but I don't think it is for everyone. I think there are men who want children and to find out that they can't have them is a, is a big deal. Yeah. And because I remember when my brother, um, uh, his wife had a miscarriage and he, he called me sobbing. He said, I would make a good father. And I said, yes, of course you would. Of course they did have twins later. So, but, um, you know, it, it was hard because I identified with the hero because I have a disabled son. So it was kind of like, you, when you have a, a child who's severely disabled, you almost, you have to grieve the child that you expected and accept the child that you have. And it just brought that all back up again um, yeah. because it was very close in time to when that happened. And, um, but, you know, I have the most adorable child in the world. I really do. He's, 35 now downstairs waiting for me to put him to bed because he still likes mommy to kiss him good night and, and say night night sleep tight but anyway but that one was hard because I I just sat in the coffee shop crying all the time <laughs> I was writing it and then all my friends were like we can get in all. the corner again just sat there with <laughs> crying <laughs> so, so what was the hardest hardest for you to write Oh God! The volume books. I think I, I think in every book, um, <laughs> in every book, there's always a pe there's usually a kind of there's not been many where I haven't wanted to just like give it all up, you know, and kind of go and live in a hippie commune somewhere. <laughs> and, um, I think my hardest book though to write was my second book, Her Enemy at the Altar, just because. I'd been contracted for two books and I, it was my dream to be a writer. And, you know, I'd sold the first book and they expected the second book and it was that difficult second album. It was like, yeah, what yeah, if yeah. at the end of this, they say, no, thanks. You know, thanks for those two books, but we're done. I think that was probably my hardest. I, I, I still love the story and, and, you know, but it was hard because I put that much pressure on myself, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's it's not unusual. The whole sophomore book thing is a thing. I mean, you know, especially with people who are successful with the first book. Yeah, that's not unusual. You never you never quite know, do you? You know, publishing is. I mean, I'm very fortunate. I've I've written. I'm writing book thirty one now, so it's been going. I'm not near you. What are you at? Uh, I actually, Verity is my fiftieth novel. Yeah. So yeah, I'm, I've got another twenty something to go, but you know, I, I've done I've done well with it. But sometimes publishers drop authors, and they've got a restart, and you know, and we're all, aren't we? We're all neurotic as authors. Like we've all got the most yeah. 
the most horrific imposter syndrome. I remember asking you about imposter syndrome a couple of years back, saying, when does it go? And you just said it gets worse with every book. And <laughs> it does. <laughs> I go, am I a husband? Am I washed up now? Uh, you know, it, it, it never stops. <laughs> it never stops, unfortunately. But you get, well, I have a, I always have a point in the book where I want to call my agent and go, okay, I don't know what I was thinking. This book is not going to work. I'm going to have to throw this out. We're going to have to get a delayed um, you know, turn in, it's not going to work. Da, da, da. There's always a point. And now I don't write her about it. I used to write her about it. And she would say, now, now, you know, <laughs> but now I know it's part of my process and I keep going, it'll be okay. It'll, but yeah, I, I have one of those. I, it's not quite as extreme as though I'm going to quit and go join a, you know, cult or something. <laughs> I'm but a theatrical dramatic person, Sabrina, you know, I, I can't help it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my next question. Okay, Much Ado is my absolute favorite Shakespeare play. It is. And maybe a lot of romance readers and writers feel that way because the sexual tension is so great in that and it's the enemies to lover trope. How can you not love it? And, um, but I have to ask, is it also yours or do you have a different choice from your characters or do you even like Shakespeare? I mean, not everybody likes Shakespeare. To put some contact, context into that question for everyone, um, in Never Wager with a Wallflower, Venus Merriwell's favourite book is, is um, a, a Much Ado About Nothing. It's the Shakespeare play, isn't it? And she, she adores it. And in her diary entries, She's looking for a Benedict, you know, she's and and I think I I I do like Shakespeare's comedies. I'm not a fan of his tragedies, probably because I'm a glass half full person, not a glass half empty person. Um, but I love Much Ado About Nothing. I love the banter between them. I love the fact that everybody else can see that they're meant to be for each other apart from them and how they fight it. And I kind of, there's always like, you know, sometimes there's always a little bit of an homage to something. And and I and never wager with a wallflower is that, you know, that they are very much Beatrice and Benedict, I think. They they butt heads, they they've butted heads for five years. Um their first meeting, um, Galahad and Venus's first meeting is um happens in Never Rescue a Rogue. And she thinks he's a burglar in the middle of the night and she comes at him in a nightdress and um, screaming like a banshee into the garden and flattens him and pins him to the ground. Um, so they've had this kind of, you know, his cousin is married to her sister. So they, they've butted heads for five years. And, and so this story, a lot like Beatrix and Benedict, they've known each other all their lives and butted heads all their lives. Like, and I just, it's nice to play with that. So, so yeah, I do like, I, I like Taming of the Shrew as well um, as a Shakespeare play. I know it's not, you know, it's not very politically correct nowadays, but I like the, you know, the idea of enemies to lovers. I mean, it's just the best trope, isn't yeah. it? I, yeah. I, I, I like all romance tropes, to be honest, but it, there's something about enemies to lovers. It's a special one. You know, you get that lovely yeah. friction, that wonderful chemistry and some of the greatest banter I mean when when I don't know how you write but I'm weird when I write I I I'm not a plotter I see the story like a film in my head so I see and hear it and I hear what these characters say to each other and I just write it down and some of the things they say sometimes I sit there laughing my head off you know thinking that's it and then sometimes I sit there crying and my son used to like, you know, he'd walk past my office and he'd just get his phone and he'd just video me and I'd be sat there typing going, <laughs> mad woman. Uh, but yeah, no, I do like some of Shakespeare's comedies. Can't be doing with Hamlet. Got no interest in Romeo and Juliet. 
Um, I like the funny ones and I like the happily ever afters. And if they don't end happily, I can't be bothered to read them. Who needs that misery in their life? <laughs> I I read Hamlet when I was in high school, which I don't think anybody should ever be forced to read Hamlet in high school. Um, because first of all, you're not old enough to understand the nuances. And secondly, it's horrible. It, 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 it's very depressing. <laughs> Everybody dies in the end and whatever. And and I'm like you, I'm a, a glass half full person. So I don't want to read tragedy. I think the only Shakespeare tragedy that I love is, is King Lear. And <clears throat> mostly because of the, you know, that scene where King Lear, you know, is carrying his his dead daughter saying, you know, wanting her to breathe again and everything. But um and I'm, stuff. Real, I'm, stuff. I'm real close to my dad. So, <laughs> you know, okay. but um that's that's the rest of it. I, you know, I hated that Romeo and Juliet ends with them both dead. I don't I spoiler alert, it ends with them both. Yeah. Do you know, uh, you know, I love Hollywood musicals and the one I hate, I cannot watch, and they remade it, Spielberg remade it, was West Side Story. And one night, not so long ago, um, my husband said, oh, let's watch this on the Disney Channel. He went, you like a musical? And I'm like, oh, God, not West Side Story. And we sat through it, and at the end of it, he was kind of like, well, that was miserable. And I went, yep, yeah, it's Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> Terrible. That's, right. That's what it is, yeah. And uh, yeah, I just, I don't, I don't want, I mean, there's a reason I write romance, you know, I, I like a happy ending. I really do. And um, so I'm with you. I like much ado, but my, I have a little soft spot for, oh, and shoot, of course, the title went completely out of my head. It's like one of my favorite plays, but it's one of his very early comedies, Love's Labor's Lost. Um, I knew if I didn't think too hard about it, it'd pop into my head. But um, I I took Shakespeare in, in college because I had to, because I was an English major. And I was like, well, you know, and you know, it's hard to get through Shakespeare when you're reading it and you're reading all the little explanations and stuff. And then our teacher took us to see a production. I had never seen a Shakespeare production and it was Love's Labor's Lost. And all of a sudden, I understood. It was like it was always he, Shakespeare wrote things to be performed. Never right. he did. He did to be read. So and, and after that, I had to see every. You know, I didn't even. I just wanted to see every production. I I wanted to see them all. So I've seen a lot of Shakespeare productions, but I still have a soft spot for Love's Labor's Loss because there is a lot of banter and the ending has a little few things that, you know, I mean, you know, they're going to end up together, but they're, it's kind of delayed, but, but I still love that. It, Classic, romance. Classic romance. Yeah. You know, you know, they're made for each other. You've just got to put them on this journey and give them a tough time. That's yeah. what we do. We torture our heroes and heroines. We're right. actually quite evil people. Uh, yes, we are. <laughs> and we have so much fun doing it. <laughs> yes, I I don't uh I see my my books as a movie too, but I think you know I'm a plotter. I have yeah. to know what's gonna happen, or I feel I, I am almost paralyzed if I don't know what's gonna happen. It's the how it happens that is that is interesting. I, not even I need to have those, you know, like this will happen. It's big picture kind of things, but I That's have the to have thing. them talking. See, I'm, the, I'm the opposite. So if I, when I've tried plotting and I think I know what happens, I get bored with it. Yeah, that's my routine. I find like I, I've plotted uh, two books in my life. The first one, the, the Discerning Gentleman's Guide, I plotted it. I had this great idea of what was going to happen in the end. The book by chapter two, if this was my plot, the book did this. And it's still one of my favorite books. But I can't. I'm the exact opposite. I think it's funny, well, isn't it? What, I, I, so I have a critique partner and it, not Deb. I have two critique partners. But Rex Sandbeck now is absolutely a, a pantser. And 
she writes, and this is my theory about why that happens. She writes to discover the plot. That's what she wants to see what's going to happen because she doesn't know. I write to discover the characters because when I start, I have like what you would consider to be like paper doll. I mean, people who are character writers know every nuance of their characters going in. They just don't know what they're going to do. I, yeah, I, I don't have any idea who my characters are. And so I have the same reaction you do when I'm writing dialogue. It's like they say things and I go, oh, his mother was X. Well, I got to fix that in my plot. Let me fix that because that <laughs> that is not at all what I thought. I thought he hated his mother because of Y, but it's really because of Z, you know, or whatever. And, um, or maybe he really loves his mother. Oh, well, that changes everything. You know, that is what happens to me because I don't know my characters. So I write to discover my characters. And by the end, we're just running, you know, it's just like, yes, yes. I think that's why, um, in a way, writing a series, sometimes the later books are the easier ones to write because by then the peripheral characters, you know enough about them that you're like, right. okay, Let's get cracking, you know, what we've got, right. yeah, where, which you can't do when you're starting on a fresh page. When you, I think the first of a series is always hard as well because you've got to introduce the series, haven't you? But it's right. that delicate balance of like, you've had it in your sister book, you're designing Mary, I'm going to say designing Mary Wells, designing debutantes right. uh, series. And I've got it in my Mary Wells sister series in that you want to introduce all three sisters in the first book. But you've got to be really careful that the other two don't overshadow the leading lady. And it's that's it. Right. That's it's a hard thing to do, isn't it? In in a first book of a series to kind of put enough of the second and third sister in it, in it or the second sister, at least the second character in that first book that when the book's finished, readers go, oh, I really love that story. Can't wait to find out what happens to so and so. It's 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 hard to do, isn't it? Whereas yeah. when you get that third book, and like when with me with this third book, and I could see you've done it with accidentally his, you know the stories of those other sisters, so you can actually you have a bit more fun, I think, sometimes with that because you haven't got ends to tie up, yeah. have you? On those sorts of things. Well, you the know. only thing is if you if you I I like to have a overarching like mystery or something like that. And that's what's hard because you can't. So I usually know that at the beginning, what the overarching mystery is, it often changes slightly by the end, but, but I usually know, but I did not know who the phantom was or why he was the phantom in this series till I was halfway through the second book and I wrote Deb and said I know who the phantom is because you'll spoil it you'll spoil I know, it <laughs> I know who the phantom is and why more importantly why was he the phantom and I didn't know and and she said I figured you already knew that you're such a plotter. I'm like, no. And, but, but what happened was then when I got to the third book, I was like, oh crap, I wish I had known from the beginning because I would have laid this out better and I would have laid that out better. And, you know. See, this series for me, I, I've done that. I've had a, I've had a theme that runs through things, but this series for me, I actually, I just decided three sisters three separate types of stories, um, three kind of very, very different. I, I think all three of the Merry Wells, each story is a very different sort of story. There's no overarching thing, apart from the fact that they're sisters. Right. But there's, it's just, you know, they've got three very different personalities. And so Never Fall for Your Fiancé is a, a fake dating Um and never rescue a rogue's got a bit of a mystery in it because obviously he doesn't you know doesn't know if right. he's actually the duke right. right um then this one is a kind of enemies to lovers you know boy next door orphans misbehaving uh, with incidents with pigeons oh i that is one of the funniest scenes it's so <laughs> funny i love that scene, <laughs> that scene. Well, i don't want to give anything away but 
You so, just have to, everybody has to read the pigeon scene. It's hilarious. Yeah, there's, um, there's, <laughs> you must have had a great fun writing that. Yeah, Galahad has bought the building next door to the orphanage that the orphanage wanted. And so, like, Venus, Venus is orphans. She's got Tommy and Sidney Claypole, these twin boys, who decide they're going to avenge her. And so they go, they do all sorts of sabotage in the building next door while stuff's being done. And I, I just, um, I was on a writing retreat with some friends, and I was thinking, oh, God, where would I haven't written anything really funny in this book. I haven't written, there's wit in it, but there's not a real kind of, I'm a big fan of Frasier and um, a big fan of Oscar Wilde. And I do love those kind of when comedy becomes a little bit farcical, but life does that sometimes. And I need, I wanted a scene like that in Never Wager with a Wallflower. And then I was on this writing retreat somewhere. Um, we were on the coast and uh, th th there was this this pigeon like outside where I was writing outside the window and I kept looking at this pigeon and then I suddenly thought I I'm going to write a scene with a pigeon in and so that's what I did <laughs> and, um, yeah it came out well I think <laughs> <laughs> yes it did it was hilarious <laughs> and the orphans in general are hilarious they were they were great they and I and you know I just love how Galahad is with them and how she is the fact that each one of them has a different relationship. You know, her relationship with them is different than his relationship with them. Yeah. But can understand by watching each other that the other person is approaching it the best yeah. way, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's just, you know, it's, I think it's always fun. Um, I think it's always fun to throw something because Galahad's quite a secretive character. You know, he doesn't talk about himself. He, um, his past is always a bit of a mystery. So it was kind of, it was a nice way to kind of tease out his backstory. Right. It's like right. his relationship with those orphans who quite frankly, sometimes needed strangling, but you know, <laughs> I, think, I think, you know, I fell in love with Galahad because of the well, way he behaved with those kids they're they're all like mid well some of them are a little older but like middle middle grade uh what we would call a uh middle uh i can't remember what we call it now but anyway well, this, 13, you know that that old. age of puberty and P oh, oh, yeah yeah it's the oh they're so hard to handle at that age it's just well, i used to be a, a a secondary school teacher here in the UK oh, yeah. and taught teenagers from 11 to 16. And I've got, I love teenagers as much as I kind of sometimes wanted to kill them all. Um, but they are, I find it's, it's a fascinating age, all the, yeah. the hormones and they think they know everything. And oh, yeah. yeah. Just, yeah, they're, they're, they're good fun. Young kids are, Young kids in stories are nice, and there's always lots of young kids, but teenagers, there are there are special <laughs> kids, and there's some creep to be had with them. Yeah. Okay. One, I know we're, well, actually, this is my last question because you answered the very last question. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I just wanted to say the whist, the card playing scenes were great, they were fabulous. And um, did you learn whist? in order to do them i had to learn regency whist oh, oh my goodness and i'm i am not good with numbers i'm terrible with numbers and it's a game that involves like that these two people like like being able to count cards that skill yeah and i, I found it really difficult so I sat there because it was locked down. I sat there. My husband had the instructions. We had this deck of cards and he understood it before me. And he kind of dragged me kicking and screaming through it. I, you know, it was, that was a painful experience. I have to say learning cards. I mean, the I, I'm usually good. The only card game I'm good at is snap or maybe pairs, you know, where you have to find them. I actually like, anything that involves like rules things like i, I, I like uh spades and i feel like whist is a lot like spades because in spades you have trumps and except that they're only the spades and so 
So I could follow it really well. And I can kind of dance around the rules when I write them, but I just don't want to learn how to, to play Regency Whist. I think you're very brave that you taught yourself to do that. Right, historical sometimes. You, you do a lot of research. As a historical author, often you do a lot of research. I'm lucky I've got a history background. I'm a, hi a history teacher by trade. I've got a history degree. Um, you, you, when you've written as many books as you, we have, you, you get this wealth of knowledge that you can just pull out of. But in every story, there's always something that you need to research further, isn't there? Yeah. And it's a rabbit hole. And you fall down these rabbit holes and... Um, and I learned so much um, in th this particular book. Like learning whist wasn't the only thing. You know, I had to research um, gambling hells in London. I had to, I had to do some research about Galahad, where he came from. You know, he's from New York, and I, I know New York well, but I know it as a tourist, not as somebody who lives there. And I know modern New York. So I then had to go back and I had to make sure I got my maps right. You know, you have to go back to those old maps, don't you? And go, okay, what existed when? You know, where were these things? It. What was this street called? Because a street like in London, for example, I, as I'm sure you know, yeah, a street could be called something now, but it changed name right. in like right. 1940 or something. And it used to be called this. So you're like... You have all these things in your head and you use them, but they, it shouldn't be, you, you then use them to form this backdrop, don't you? The the facts, the historical facts are like the backdrop, like on a play. Because mm -hmm. if you were just bombarding people with facts, it'd be like right. a textbook. It's right. hard, isn't it? Yeah, but it, you, is. but it, is, it is also fun, the things you learn. And, I but mean, you I'm did sure it beautifully, just when it get fun in there. You did it beautifully. Sorry. You did it beautifully though. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's all it's all of these things that you have to find out. Like I remember when like with Never Rescue a Rogue, I had to I said it in Shropshire, and then it was like, I've never been to Shropshire. <laughs> so I had to go to Shropshire. Do you know what I mean? You just do these things. I've got a book coming out in May, the first of the Miss Prentice's books. And he's a naval captain and it's happening in Plymouth. And I thought I need to, you know, I'd been to Plymouth, but not with the eyes of somebody who needed to understand it. So I obviously I, it was a good excuse to have a weekend away in Plymouth. And, you know, <laughs> but you you have to it's, it's you have to do these things, don't you? You have to. I know you've come to London many times to kind of. Not many because of Nick, um, because of my son, I've been to London as a after being a writer i've been to london twice i think that's right but the, the point is you've been to london so you understand the kind of nuances right of things. right I, I i'm not the history police i i, I i'm never going to criticize an author for getting like tiny things wrong because we all get tiny things wrong but as a as a british writer who lives in london when a when an author writes like that somebody in London walked three blocks, like I just want to go, it pulls me out of a story as a reader, as a London, because there are no blocks in London. You've been there. It makes no sense. Like the map, there's, if only London was a grid. You, know, <laughs> you need to navigate. <laughs> unless you've been, I think unless you've been and you've kind of seen that that the bonkers way that the the streets of London are laid out. I don't think you can write it properly. Yeah. You know, sometimes yeah. you can look at the maps. I know you can, but it's just these kind of weird things. You you have to sometimes osmose these things and pick them up. And yeah, but yeah. You know, when you went to London, where did you go? Did you do all the the Mayfair and all the? Uh, yeah, we did. Uh, we were only there a week. Uh, we had one week there. Um, we had to get care for our son for a week, and of course, my husband actually expected to go some places. <sighs> Who knew? But hey. <laughs> he had to go to the Hard Rock Cafe of all places. So selfish. Uh, <laughs> but but it was 
it was, I did love going to Hyde Park and seeing Rotten Row. Yeah. And, yeah. And I know it's not pronounced that way um, by the British, I don't think. But Rotten Row. Rotten Row. It, it, it came from Roy, Roy de. Oh, I Roy, forgot. Roy, Roy de Roy, Royal Roy, but yeah, it's a something Royal like that from the from Row. Yeah, it goes all the way back, but and then it and then it became Rotten Row. But um, it was so. I guess I was kind of expecting something other other than this dirt track that was quite wide, and I was yeah. like, so this is it. Okay, this um, is not what I pictured. <laughs> I know. I think it's. I think it's funny, isn't it? When you see these things. You yeah, know. yeah, the chief I, button all these I years. I like, like picture them. I, I was in um last last year went to Washington D.C. for the first time, and I'm a huge fan of The West Wing. I think it's one of the best written series. That you know, it's just brilliant. The characters, it's always characters, isn't it? And um, I was really looking forward to seeing the White House, and I don't quite know. I think maybe because I've seen like Buckingham Palace. I kind of assumed it would be as big as Buckingham Palace. <laughs> like, stood outside these railings going, that's tiny. Like, this, oh, this America's run from this little building. How is that possible? Um, but yeah, I think it's fascinating when you see stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. See it in the flesh. Hi, <laughs> I'm here to intervene. We've got some really great questions. Okay. Um, so... One of them is, uh, Virginia, are there any characters from your books that you think would be friends with some of Sabrina's characters? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think um, definitely I think that um, my Miss Prentice's protégé's story um, is about a girl's school. And I think that they would get all the characters in that would get on really, really well with the characters from the um, school for um series that she's done and I like to think you know they'd all get on <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah I think so I think so yeah. I think it's, it's a it's that's an interesting one isn't it I've read so many of Sabrina's Sabrina's books but the thing is I'm terrible for I might be good at making up titles but I'm terrible for remembering them oh, I remember I oh me too absolutely <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> So what's the next great question then? Um, oh, this one I think will be a good one. Um, if Never Wager with a Wallflower was made into a movie and you could have an author cameo, what scene would you want to be in? That's a good question. Oh my goodness. What scene would I want to be in? I would want to be in the aftermath scene of the pigeon. Um, when Galahad is having his backside stitched. That's where I'd like to be because in my head, he's got a very nice behind. <laughs> in mine too. <laughs> you, could both be there. you could be in a cameo with it too. That's a great scene too. That That is a hilarious scene. I could just picture every minute of it. It was funny. <laughs> People how going, would you, wait, who would you be though? You couldn't be the doctor because he's male. I was, could be the house. One of the servants there. Well, I thought one of the servants was. Um, oh, I've, it's terrible. I forgot my own character's name. The the housekeeper, the the yes. the woman yeah. in. Uh, yeah, I'd be her. Whatever yeah. her name is. It's my book, but I've forgotten it. I wrote it eighteen <laughs> months ago. <laughs> yeah, I know the feeling. Yeah. <laughs> um. Another question is, how do you come up with the names of your characters? <laughs> Okay, so in the Merrywell Sisters, um, the idea was that um, each sister has been named after a goddess. So Minerva, Diana, and Venus. And I wanted to give her the name Venus because this, she's got this curvy figure um, and she's very pretty and she hates, but she wears glasses, which she hides behind. And I wanted to give a character a name that she loathed. And so Venus was like, she hates it in all of the books. So she sh shortens herself to V. And um, Galahad likes to rile her by calling her Venus all the time. Um, Galahad, 
that name came about because um, in Never Rescue a Rogue, Giles Sinclair, um, all of the, his family, they all, all the character, all the, right going back to the Norman conquest, all of their names begin with a G. So there was a Gregoire and a, you know, a Gervais hey, and a Giles yeah. and a Gregory and a, all these different names. And I wanted a name and I kind of thought it'd be quite fun to give Galahad a horrible name to, you know, the connotations of Venus being this kind of goddess of love and Galahad is this kind of like knight in shining armour. I wanted to give them names that they'd both dislike intensely. Um, so that's where their names came from. Awesome. And I think we have time for one more question, um, which is what other authors inspire you or and or what other historical romances have you read recently that you would recommend? Oh, OK. Well, I would highly recommend you read Accidentally Here's when um, <laughs> book comes out in January, because I've absolutely loved that one. Um what authors do inspired me? Uh, do you know I'm going to embarrass her here and say that before she was my friend, uh, she was very much part of one of my inspirations because um, I loved her books. I think the first, the first sort of Regency author I discovered was Julia Quinn, um, but then I think once I got into the genre. Because um, bizarrely, although I was a history teacher, I always read contemporary. And so I read this Julia Quinn by accident because I didn't have a contemporary book. And then that spiraled and snowballed into, you know, if you've if you enjoyed this, you might like that on Amazon. And then I found Sabrina and that was kind of like, oh, my goodness, she's written so many books. This is marvellous. Um, and uh, I it's Going all the way back to 2017 and I was a nobody <clears throat> I had a couple of books out and I was a last minute addition to this um romance festival in France in Paris and they put me on a panel with Sabrina Jeffries and I was fangirling I'm thinking oh my god this is you know no one's gonna care that I'm there and, but I'm just going to enjoy, I'm just going to soak it up. And from the moment she walked into that room, because I get everywhere like 20 minutes early. So I was sat there and she gets everywhere really early. I think we're sisters really, aren't we? <laughs> I really think we are. And we just started chatting and we've been friends ever since, haven't we? Um, yes, we have. Times at different reader events, we've been friends ever since. And they always say, you know, don't meet your idols. And there have been authors I've met, and I won't name them, who I've loved their books, but I've not loved them as a person. But I absolutely adore Sabrina. Who else has inspired me? Oh, Nora Roberts. Oh my I goodness. Know. That woman can write a book. Um, I also for she um, writes them so fast. She, she does. Writes them so fast. I just I don't know how she does I just it. She's just wonderful. Um, and they're else? good books. They're great. They're, oh, they're outstanding. Montana Sky, Carnal Innocence, Northern Lights. Oh, I remember the names of those. Sorry, but they're nice, easy names yeah, to remember. Yeah, yeah. Um, who else has inspired me? I think there's all sorts of, you know, I love Lorraine Heath's books. Um, I love Tessa Dare's books. Julianne Long, I think that she seems to me is somebody who hasn't had the the big success that she deserves because her Penny Royal Green series is outstanding, absolutely brilliant Regency series from beginning to end. But, you know, so there's lots of people that I really like. Um, Jana McGregor as well. She's, a, she's another friend, but I read her books before she became my friend. And uh, I love her stories too. So, um, yeah, so many. I think... If you're a writer, often you're a reader first, and um, uh, there are just you just I've I, I ate books for breakfast, dinner, and you know <laughs> uh, before I became a writer, and that was my kind of training course. But there's so many I admire. My awesome. Well, thank y'all so much for such an awesome uh, conversation. This was so much fun to watch. 
Um, and I want to thank everybody in our virtual audience for joining us tonight. Um, we're so grateful for you to be here and to uh, ask great questions. Um, and please check out our website, eastcitybookshop.com, for more information on events, book clubs, and how you can get Sabrina and Virginia's books. Thank y'all. Thank, thank you for having us. It was fun. <laughs> it was fun. <laughs>